It's my pleasure to be here. I'm just going to go and grab the clicker thing. Um, did everyone get a copy of this before we start, just to make sure? Is there anybody in the audience who hasn't got a copy of the What's My Type book? Perfect. What you'll also see on your um, tables is a set of plastic cards which have all the types described on them. <coughs> Can you please not walk away with those cards at the end? Um, because you wouldn't believe how expensive they are. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start um, by getting you to think a little bit about the question that Veronica very kindly gave me in the last session. I cannot believe that we haven't collaborated um, over these events because the question that we're going to answer this afternoon is who are you at your core? And in terms of the core beliefs that you have and the core person that you are, how do you show up and what does that mean for you as a leader and what does that mean for you in terms of trust and trust relationships? So I'm going to do that in a minute by talking a little bit about myself, because I quite like talking about myself, as you can probably tell. And in talking about myself, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my story. And the intention of me doing that is not because I'm a complete egotist. It's because I want to give you a sense of my type through my story. So that you can think about what is my story, what is your story, and in terms of your story, how has that informed who you are and how you show up? Because very often, that's the bit of us that we want to hide, or there are bits of it that we want to conceal, and pretend we're not that. We want to pretend that we're something else, or we want to pretend that we're going to take on somebody else's cloak at work, or somebody else's way of being at work, in order to be who we think we should be. And actually, my premise is that what we need to do is show up more as ourselves. So I'm going to help you to think about that a little bit this afternoon and to ask yourself some important questions about how much you do that. But I thought I'd start by giving you... Um, we're going to start with a little bit of music again now. It's going to pop on. No, it's not. So we're going to give you um, a little bit here of the invitation. I changed this after hearing Veronica speak earlier today because, as I said, she gave me a wonderful leading because this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at who are you at your core how do you achieve results? So how do you do results? How do you do achieving outcomes? What can you readily do from your orientation? So in a minute, we're going to look at the types. We're going to look at how the types show up in the Enneagram. And the types are simply a set of orientations. They're how we orient ourselves into the world. We're going to look at, is your benevolence in your head? I loved it when she said that this morning. Is your benevolence something that you believe it you think you are it, but others don't experience it. So sometimes what the Enneagram does is it invites us to look at who are we at our core and to really question that, to question, this is who I may think I am, who I think I am, this is how I may think I show up, but is that what other people see? Because what other people see is a bit of us that we're trying to get them to trust. It's a bit of us that we're trying to engage with in another person, okay? So we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to think about that question a little bit. I'm going to ask you about your gut feel. Is your gut feel real? We work a lot on instinct. We're going to look a little bit at instinct. And I'm going to invite you to think about how might we check it? So when we have that gut feeling, how might we actually check whether that's an appropriate feeling or not? And last but by no means least, um, particularly for the heart types, this is an easy thing to do. Can you find it in your heart to forgive your leaders and can your people forgive you? Okay. So there are many people in this room who have done things that they'd rather not have done, who will have done things that we regret. And there are many people working for leaders who we like to blame and think they're incompetent and they're useless and they're whatever adjectives we like to think about in relation to them. And somehow to, we need to get beyond that in order to trust people, in order to trust ourselves. And that involves, at some level, a level of forgiveness. So we're going to invite you to think about that too as I'm speaking. So I want to say a little bit about myself because I like talking about myself. And just want to give you a story to illustrate how the core of my type, I think, was formed. So I come from the orientation of the type 7, or as some Enneagram teachers would say, from point 7. And remember that the objective of the Enneagram is to try and work, work and operate from all of the points. So to be able to work from all the nine types, to orientate ourselves from the nine types. But our main type 
is a type that we default to because we learned it in childhood. Okay? We learned how to behave like something and like someone, mostly in childhood. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a story about my childhood. When I was about 10, um, my, my father was an engineer. Um, he used to work nights, he worked really hard. And one day he came home and he had lost his job. He'd lost his job, he'd been made redundant. And the reason he was made redundant is because he um, and a group of his, t his team had invented a patent for his employer and he'd had the audacity to ask his employer, as a foreman, um, will we get any additional bonus for making this patent, for making this thing, that's this little twiddle thing, that has made them, will make the company millions? And the answer was, no, you won't. Um, fine, okay. So he, being my father, he would have had a few little things to say about that. Um, he also happened to be um, an AUEW shop steward. Um, and as a consequence of that, we, some of you may remember, um, I'm of course far too young, but I do remember it, the three-day week. And during the three-day week, um, where we didn't have lights and things like that, he had said, could we, shift, could, could we change the shifts? Could we change the shift system so that actually some of the guys actually do nights and days and get to see their families and stuff like that? And can we just change the shift, shift system, even temporarily? So because of these two things, he became seen as a troublemaker. And he was made redundant at a time when people weren't really made redundant. Redundancy wasn't a word that was used very much. Um, and there was something humiliating about being unemployed. There was something about being unemployed that wasn't a good thing. It wasn't something you recovered from very quickly. He did actually recover from it quite quickly, within about a year. But I remember as a child this being quite an important thing, quite an important thing in the family. And my parents were very kind people. You know, they, kind, they did a lot for the community. Um, my mum did a lot for homeless people, a lot for her church. My dad did a great deal for um, people in the community, and, and he was called the poor man's lawyer. So you'll be somebody in our area that somebody would come to and say, can you read this HP agreement for me and tell me if I'm about to sign my life away? Or can you read this for me and tell me if I'm going to sign my house away? So that was my background. So that's the kind of environment in which I grew up. And when I went to university, I went and studied law. Okay? I'm not even sure if I chose the law or whether it chose me, but I chose to go and study the law. And after two years, I thought, I cannot bear this. I can't bear it. It's too boring. So I loved, loved, loved the case law. I loved the stories of case law. I loved the criminal, criminals' cases. I loved the tort cases. I loved all the stuff about family law, about whose, whose fence was whose and whose horse was whose and how do you decide. I absolutely hated reading Hansard and the judgments of Lord Denning. Lord Denning became the person that I dreamt about every night. And I just hated it. So I thought, my life, I was sitting in the library one day at university and thought, this is, my life's too short to do this. I'm not doing it. So it took me about two years to decide this. I was obviously a slow learner. And in year three, I decided I was going to go and do um, some sociology and some criminology. So I did that and thought, well, maybe I'll be a criminologist. You know, that sounds like an interesting job, you know, working out why do people do things, quite like that. Um, until I worked out that I had to do a master's degree and I was getting bored of university by then and thought I need to travel and do something more, far more interesting, far more adventurous than sitting here reading books. Um, so I decided not to do that straight away but to decide over the course of the next year whether I might do it. I never went back to criminology. And instead I decided that I would become um, a personnel officer and work with people in organisations. Now, some people, not me, would say there's not a lot of difference between being a criminologist and being in HR. <laughs> but um, that's what I did. And I had a very traditional HR career um, and high-achieving type. Youngest HR director in the volunteer sector at 32. Not now, I wouldn't be, but I was then. Um, so I had a kind of sense of a mission in life, of being driven by things in life and being driven by right and wrong to a degree but being driven by, actually, the world of work needs people who can look at fairness, who can think about options, and who can have a vision about how people might operate in the world. So that was kind of why I was doing it, really. And in terms of my experience, this left-hand side is the organisations that I worked in. This is my qualification. So in terms of the Enneagram, it's probably important for you to know that I did uh, qualify as a level A psychometric assessor. I've used lots and lots of psychometric assessment during my career, and I have to say, I'm not sure how much difference it really made. When I look back at my career and think about all the assessment that I did with people, 
I'm not sure how much difference a lot of those assessments made, particularly in terms of recruitment. The Enneagram, I think, is quite different. I'll explain why in a minute. So this is where I did my training. Most of my training I've done either in the UK or in the US. And these are the all kind of organisations that I work with. Now, when I get to this point, people kind of say, well, why don't you just work in the public sector? Or why don't you just work in the private sector? And for my type, that would be just too easy. And I'd get bored. So I work across public and private sector organisations to stop me, not because they're boring, but because I would get bored. So I don't just work in the private sector in publishing or just work in the private sector in banking because I would get stale. And the last thing that I want as a type seven is to ever get bored. Okay? So can you see how my story is in my type? My type is in my story. This is yes and this is no. Okay? Great, great. So because I'm completely egocentric, I've put these up here. Um, so this little book that my coaching colleague Jenny and I wrote was intended as a primer. When I first started studying the Enneagram, um, just about three and a half, four years ago now, I started studying it because I'd been resisting it for about 10 years and a very good friend of mine kept saying, you will love the Enneagram, you ought to explore it, you really ought to do that. And the last thing that a type seven likes is being told what to do. So I ignored him for a long time until I went on one of his courses called Love and the Enneagram, and I loved it. I absolutely loved what he'd done. And I uh, decided to go and do the training. And the reason I like the Enneagram is for several reasons. It's got some uh, basis in the reality of uh, what one would call a, a valid test, in the sense that it's been tested on two and a half million people, quite a big sample group. Um, it's a test which allows people to discover for themselves. So some of you sitting in this room will still be unclear what your type is. And that's fine. Okay? It's not a test. It's not a you, you must decide by Thursday type test. We must categorise you and tell you what you are. Um, I could probably sit here and say, well, I think you might be more of a two than a three or a four. But the only person who really knows what your orientation is, is you. Okay? You might show us aspects of different types, but the only person who really knows your orientation is you. So sometimes with the Enneagram, people can take a year to work out what their type is. They can take months to work out what their type is. Because what we're really doing is examining what are the patterns that I have run during my life? What are the patterns that are common in my life that help me to understand what my type, what my orientation is? Okay? Now, I've put the book up here because it, there's a story behind this, not because I'm egocentric. Um, these reviews are the unsolicited reviews that we had on Amazon, having had the book on Amazon for about a fortnight. Okay, we sold it as, a, as an e-book as well as a, a paper book. We'd also sold some at an Enneagram workshop, and some people have put things up there. But these were unsolicited. And when we saw these, we were like, oh, hurrah, marvellous, people like it, it's great, we're getting five-star reviews, how marvellous is that? And then we started to say, hang on a minute, people are going to think this is all fixed, because the reviews look too good. So we started saying to people, you know when you review our book, can you put it down as a three or a four? Because actually everyone's going to believe it's a fix. They're going to believe we're completely inauthentic and it's all fixed and it all looks like fives and it all looks too good and therefore they won't trust it and they won't buy the book. Okay? Now, if I was saying that to an American audience, they'd think I was completely crazy. I'd just be saying, well, that's awesome. It's amazing. Why don't you do more of it? But actually, it's a really interesting thing that we do that. We sometimes think, particularly in our culture, across Britain, we think, actually, I've got to be really careful about how I show up, because if I show up looking like I'm really good, people won't trust me. <coughs> if I show up looking as though actually I know what I'm talking about, people won't trust me, they'll think I'm egocentric, they'll think I'm really difficult, they'll think there's something about me that they can't connect to. So my invitation to you is to just think for a minute, but actually, do you do that? As a leader, are you sometimes scared to shine your light for fear that people won't trust you? So we're going to take a look at this symbol called the Enneagram. All the Enneagram means, Ennea means nine, gram means diagram. Okay? So it's very simplest. The Enneagram is simply a diagram of nine types. The symbol itself goes back to something like the first century. Um, the nine types in terms of this particular system, 
Parts of it can be traced back about 200 years, but this particular system to round about the 1930s. Okay, I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about where the, why there are lines on here and things in a moment. So some key principles around the Enneagram, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're going to work with it. The Enneagram is a psychological framework for self-understanding. So it's about self-understanding. It's really, really tempting to start saying, playing the game, spot my type. Okay, start saying, well, I think you're a four, I think you're a three, I think you're a two, I think you're a one, I think you're a... And to also start using the type descriptions as an excuse for why we are like we are. And the invitation of the Enneagram is to help us to facilitate our own understanding about ourselves. And to sometimes look at the aspects of ourselves that we really don't want to see. And I'll give you a clue. When you did the assessment and you picked up the book... And the book does say to you, and it's true, that not all of these features are in all of the types. Okay, so if you've got, if you're type eight, not all of the description list uh, will be manifest in you, but some of it will. And you'll know that you're resisting something if you look at the negative side of the list and say, well, I do all those positive things, but I don't do that one. Okay? So we begin to resist that which is ourself. And sometimes in these relationships where we are having a lack of trust, or we think there may be a lack of trust, it's because we cannot see what other people can see. And sometimes what we can't see is a very positive thing. And sometimes what we can't see is not so positive. So what the, the Enneagram does is invite us to go and look at those not so positive and positive aspects to be able to work out for ourselves, how should I show up? How do I show up? And how might I show up more of me as more of me more often? Origins are in Persia, first century. Uh, the work of Gurdjieff and Ishazo and Naraha um, in the 30s through to the 70s kind of built the Enneagram as a system. And what they did eff effectively is... Um, so these are not the Reti assessment. These are not the million people who informed the assessment. They went around the world trying to actually ascertain, a bit like Jungian archetypes, but similar kind of thing around about the same time, some of them, trying to ascertain what is it how do, we define pe how do we define people? How do we help people to understand themselves? How do we help people to question what they're about and why they're here? How do we be enable people to think about the fact that there are other people like them, that they're not on their own? And how do we begin as a, as a society to use the different attributes and positive attributes of people to be able to help society and to help the world? That was effectively their premise. Attached really orientations, I've said that before, and they're patterns of behaviour that we learn in childhood that we default to. So because we default, default to them, we sometimes don't notice them. So my thing about the untidy desk, um, I can find a piece of paper anywhere in my office. Somebody said to me, where's blah, blah, I'll find it. If somebody else came into my office to try and find it, they would have no chance. It's like a car crash, okay, most of the time. So the, one of the things of the seven is being quite scattered in our approach. Now, I wouldn't see that as a problem, would I? Because I can find everything. But my boss, who awarded me, uh, who put me forward for the award for the most untidy desk, could see that in me. And he could see that actually it could be career limiting for me. Because he used to come into my office and say, you're great at your job. Your, your organisation skills look appalling. Your desk's a mess. You look like you don't know what you're doing. And I would say to him, ask me a question. Okay, whatever. I'll get challenging about it and say, ask me a question. And it's just, it's not about your competence. It's about your desk. Okay. Now, as it happens, what I did was tidy my desk. And then I got my PA to be this uber tidy desk person and to train me in how to be a tidy desk person. Um, and strangely, as a result of this, I got promoted. So, in fact, my boss was hoisted by his own petard <coughs> by getting me to tidy my desk. But he didn't mind, of course, because he was right and he was a type 8. It was fine. But that's the kind of thing that happens, okay? And the thing to remember is that no one type is better than any other. So we may think, actually, but I wouldn't want to be that. And the reason why I'm saying that about a particular type is be normally because there is something in that type for us to learn. It's not about them. Okay? So no one type is better than any other. We are trying to work our way around all of the types understand all of the types and be all of the types in order that we can be behaviourally flexible. And we have the capacity to do that. So we can develop all nine orientations 
and we can cultivate them in ourselves. So really, this is an inside job. It's about our core. It's not about somebody else. I like to think of the Enneagram as a lens check. What we're doing, really, is looking through a lens of our experience and our behaviours, and we're obser observing how we do things in that lens, and we're observing the lens. So for any of the, how many people in here in the room do coaching or have trained in coaching? Okay, so if you think about the lens as um, we're, doing, we're looking at behaviour, we're looking at what we do and how we do it, and then what we're doing is we're observing ourselves, like a coach would do, we're observing that behaviour, and almost saying to ourselves, actually, I need to question my own lens. I need to question how I show up. I need to question my own core beliefs, my own core type. And our type point is something we do based on our perception of the world and the response that we have to the world. It's not who we are. Okay? So sometimes, I'll, and I said it earlier, I'm a type 7. Okay? That's an identity level statement. I'm a, I'm a type 7. And yet I know that that isn't who I am. What I am and who I am is all of those types when I choose to access them. But how I show up most of the time is from that orientation. Okay? It's my behaviours. And today what we're going to do is we're really asking ourselves, how do you do that? How do you do that type? How do you do that orientation? And what does it do for you? And sometimes other people are thinking, do what? Because most of the time, when we're asking somebody a question, how do you do that? Somebody said to you, how do you do that? We have to stop and think about it. We have to stop and really examine. Actually, how, how do I do that? I don't, I don't know how I've always done it. I don't, I don't know how I do it. Okay? So sometimes we're like this ostrich on the left. Um, I can't my left and right confused sometimes. We're on the, the ostrich on the left saying, do what? Because we haven't even noticed that we're doing something that somebody else is asking us a question about. So in terms of trust relationships, this can be quite important. Okay? Because we sometimes don't know what we're doing because we can't see our behaviour, we can't observe our behaviour readily unless we stand back and reflect. Unless we stand back and take a look at what am I doing? How, what am I operating from? What's my operating system? And if we can't do that, it can be quite hard for some people to trust us. So I'm going to say a little bit about leadership before I move on to look at the type descriptions. In a minute, I'm going to explain the type descriptions to you briefly. And I'm going to talk about how each of the types um, is relevant in terms of trust. And then we're going to do a lovely exercise with some wonderful volunteers in the room who are going to come up here and give us um, some narrative. So very often when we teach the Enneagram, we teach the Enneagram from a narrative tradition. So the idea is that we hear people speak from their type or from their instinct, which I'll explain in a minute. And when we do that, we hear what it's like to come from their world. All right, so we're going to do that in a second. So stop panicking, because if you don't know you're a volunteer, you're not a volunteer, okay? <laughs> if you don't know you're a volunteer, you're not coming up here. I like this definition of handy. I use it all the time. And the reason I use it is I've never found anything better, okay? There are thousands of books out there on leadership. There are thousands of books about different styles of leadership, different ways of doing leadership, different ways of behaving in the world as a leader. This, for me, is one of the best definitions ever. Leadership remains the most studied and least understood topic in all the social sciences. We wouldn't have to keep writing about it, would we, if we understood it? We wouldn't have to keep writing books about it. Like beauty or love, we know it when we see it, but we cannot easily defy, define it nor produce it on demand. So in most of the behaviours that we have, if I said to you, can somebody come up here now and do a cartwheel? Someone will be able to do one. If I said, can somebody come up here now and do a forward roll? Someone will be able to do one. If I said, come up here now and sing, someone in the audience would be able to sing. If I said, come up here and do leadership, what would you do? You know, what would we do? Leadership's a whole amalgam of behaviours, and we can read as many books and attend as many courses like we are here. But actually, the way we translate that learning into how we show up and how we behave is, how, is what leadership is. We'll all, we've all met lots of people who've done lots of training, been on lots of courses, can recite leadership mantras, can recite lots of things about leadership. We find lots of them in academia. But actually, they couldn't lead their way out of the paper bag. 
okay? Because they haven't done this. They haven't been able to think about how do I do it? How will, how will I know I am it? How will I know I am a good leader? How will people see it in me? How will I see it in other people? So it's a seeing thing. And the real question that people are asking themselves is, why would anyone trust you enough to be led by you? So it's a great question for us to ask. I'm going to ask you just on your tables for a couple of minutes to answer this question. So just spend a couple of minutes on your table asking, why would anyone trust you, you specifically, not them or some random imagined person, but why would anyone trust you enough to be led by you? Let's do that for two or three minutes. So the, question, so the question that raises for us is how much do you do that? How much do you only let people in your teams, the people that you lead, see the good aspects of you? Because what's going to happen if they only see the good aspects of you? They'll think you're a phony. Think you're a phony. Okay. So can we take table J in the middle here? Good bit of leadership there, grabbing the microphone. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, we talked about giving trust, um, that you have to give that in order to get it back. So we talked around that. And we talked about the usual buzzwords, integrity and those type of things. Yeah. Yeah, so my invitation, thank you, is to think about giving other people trust, trusting other people to get on with it, being in integrity. And they're all great words, aren't they? And my invitation to you to think about, if I'm being led by you, what does that mean? Okay, what does it mean? Because in essence, what's happening is that we are developing a root map for people. We're saying, here's my root map for trust, thank you, here's my root map for trust as a leader. We might not know we're doing it, but we are doing it. And the questions that people are asking us are, can I align with your values? These kinds of questions, there are lots of them, but some of these kinds of questions. Can I align with your values? before I decide whether I'm going to trust you and follow you? Can I accept your rules of engagement? Do I like how you engage with me? Can I accept it? If I don't accept it, I'm going to find it quite difficult to follow you. Will I learn from you? So they're kind of almost what's in it for me going on for people. And for us, when we're thinking about our leaders. Will I learn from you? Have you got anything to teach me? Do you see me, particularly important this for the heart-based groups, the two, threes and fours, what they're really saying is, do you see me? Not the mass of people that you manage, but do you see me? Can I see you? So can I see you as you truly are, with all the negative and positive aspects of you, not just the shiny bits that you'd like me to see, not just the spin bits that you'd like me to see, so in essence, as leaders, we're creating a trust route map, whether we know it or not. And we're creating it through our behaviours, whether they're absolutely deliberate behaviours or behaviours that we can't see, that other people see us performing. Okay? We also have a big question, do you walk your talk? So do you say what you're going to do? And do you do it? Can I see a level of integrity and authenticity in how you behave? Um, I quite like this, this definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. I thought we should have a definition of trust. A firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability or strength of someone or something. So it's about belief. Belief. Okay, a firm belief in something. And our beliefs come from our thoughts, what we think about things. And they come from how people show up and um, our questioning of looking at someone and thinking, what do, do I believe how this person's turning up? Do I believe that they're able to lead me? Do I believe that they're strong? Strong enough to lead us to wherever we need to go to. So people are asking these three questions. Can we rely on you to lead us well? Do you stand by your word and can you lead us authentically? We heard this morning how important that was from Veronica. Will you hold a space for us to grow and develop? So it's not just about sending people on courses and saying, well, that would be really good for you, yeah. We've got your appraisal, we've done your appraisal, what's your development for this year? It's not about that. It's about holding the space for someone to learn, treating them as somebody who we are there to serve as leaders and creating a trust that actually we will hold them in that space in order for them to learn. 
One of the things that um, I did during my career is I uh, was asked to go and work at a hospital that had been subject to a public inquiry. And it was a mess, frankly. Um, we had people who'd been imprisoned for starving patients and experimenting on patients. And um, we walked in the door, management swoop team, as we call them, and we were told, you will have to get rid of most of this management team in this organisation. You have no choice. All the chief nurses, everybody had to get rid of them all. Um, and I said, well, we might. Okay, because in that system, if you remember back to what Tim was saying on day one, we had a whole group of people who had basically conformed with what they thought was the right thing to do. So when, what they thought was the right thing to do to preserve themselves and what they thought would keep them safe and would stop them from standing out. So do you remember when Tim was talking about the people who answer B, 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 and somebody eventually says, no, it's C. Okay? There were very few people in this organisation who'd ever said, actually, the answer is C. We're doing the wrong thing here, apart from one person who blew the whistle, which is why they're investigated. And so in that scenario, it would be really easy to just say, let's discard everybody. We'll, we'll just have to start again. But what we hadn't, of course, thought about, or what senior management hadn't thought about, is there were residents who had lived there for 20, 30 years who knew these people. They were the only anchor that people had. So we decided that rather than throwing people out and saying, right, everyone's going, that we would spend six months either trying to turn people around or allowing them to go and saying, you can go if you like. So effectively, our mantra became, be happy here or be happy somewhere else. And this is what you're going to have to do here. And if you're not happy doing that, you need to go somewhere else. So it's quite a clear message. But we're basically saying, we will hold a space for you to grow and develop. We recognise that at some level, those staff had been abused too. At some level, they hadn't been allowed to even have their own independent thought. So we were saying to people, we see you. We see the potential in you that maybe you can't see at the moment. And we will hold a space for you to grow and develop. So my invitation is for you to think about that. Is that what you do as a leader? Do you trust your people enough to allow them to grow and develop, even if they grow and develop beyond you? And do you allow them enough space to make mistakes and enough space in which to say, actually, this isn't for me? I like this. If we take a cognitive approach um, to thinking about trust and how we show up, um, George Kelly, anybody who studied cognitive behaviour therapy or anything to do with cognition will have come across his work, is a contemporary of Beck and Ellis. We're all just junior scientists trying to figure out our world so we can predict and control our environment and the reactions our behaviours will elicit from that environment. At some level, we're all control freaks. Okay, we're just trying to control our environment. We're trying to look at our environment and say, where are the risks here? How much can I control the risks and how much can I control my reaction to the risks? How much can I keep myself and other people safe here in this environment? And as a consequence, this is kind of what we do. We see the world as we are, not as the world is. Now, what does that mean for us? What it means for us over time is we could end up like this. We could end up like Agent Smith because actually the filter through which we see the world is like Agent Smith. If everyone's only just, everyone was just like me, it would be fine. So this is what we do. We have a sense of this. We have a sense of life would be much easier if everyone just saw the world like me. Now, when we're doing that, we're sitting in our type. We're sitting in our orientation and we're almost resisting the fact that the world is not, does not show up how we would like it to show up. Okay? People are not performing and behaving in the way that we would like them to perform and behave, which is like us. Now, of course, this would never work if we only ever thought of life being easy if everyone just saw the world like me. Because in truth, what would work is if everyone saw the world like me. <laughs> okay? So we do that. We do this thing to ourselves. We do this thing of saying, actually, if you just see the world like me, we'd all get along much better. And we think sometimes as leaders and not leaders, that that's what we have to do. That we have to adapt to that person's way of being and thinking in order to fit in and create a trust relationship. And there are alternatives. We don't have to do that. We can accept where people are coming from and negotiate a different kind of trust contract. 
So we're going to take a look now at the Enneagram and its features in order that we can then think about how might we use this as a way of thinking about how we show up. So let me explain the symbol to you a little bit. There are an Enneagram of nine types. If you read lots of literature on the Enneagram, you'll see the descriptions described in different ways. So the nine types sometimes have different labels on them, but effectively they're, they're the same um, orientation. For each of the types, we're going to look at the instincts, the wings. We're going to, I'm going to say a little bit about the directions, but not talk about them a great deal. And really what we're trying to do is saying, how do we trust from this particular instinct group? So let me describe those to you a little bit first. Each of the types has a wing. So the wings, very simply, you remember it like a pair of wings, are the points at either side of a type. So if I was a type two, my wing points would be one and three. If I orientated from the type five, my wing points would be six and seven. And the reason why the Enneagram doesn't say, well, you're, you're a type six and you're a type six and you're a type six and you're all the same is because we're not. Within those types, there are gradations of the type. So some people, if, if we take type six, will lean much more towards the wing of the five. Some people will lean much more towards the wing of the seven. Some people will be completely a type six and some people will be wings that will have both wings, five and seven. Okay? So the answer really, type, each type is not just that type. There are subtypes within all of these types. So I want you to think of the system as a system of gradation, not de defined definition, even though we're asking the question, what's my type? Okay, so we move within our type too. So we may meet people and think, gosh, we're both type fives, but actually they're not at all like me. I don't want to be like them. Okay. And the truth is you may not be like each other, but you orientate from the same place. In terms of the directions, these directions that you can see on the diagram here, where you see the lines going, we're not going to cover this in any detail today, but I'm really happy to send you a diagram if it's helpful to you. But each of our types has a place where we go to when we are under extreme stress and a place where we go to when we are under extreme growth, experiencing extreme growth. So sometimes in the literature, this is called the stress point and the sweet point, okay? So for example, for an eight, an eight who um, as a challenger is under deep stress would go towards the point five. So they would become highly involved in an analyzing information, investigating information, wanting to get things right. They begin to look like more of a five. When an eight is really, really on their game and they're really in touch with who they are, they become more like a two. So they really connect with the heart and become more like a two. Okay? So each of these types, we go one place when we're really, really under extreme stress, and we go another place when we're really in deep growth. So it's why I also would say to you, keep exploring your type to check. Because if you're somebody who at the moment feel in deep distress or in deep growth, you may be displaying a pattern of behavior that isn't your usual pattern of behavior. And that doesn't make it right nor wrong, it just means that it might not be your orientation, that's all. Okay. So we're going to look at the Enneagram from the position of the triads. And in terms of the triads, there are three, that's why they're called triads. And there's the gut instinct, the heart instinct, and the head instinct. And the reason why the Enneagram looks at it like this is because this is kind of how the orientations work. So if we look at the eight, nine, and one, the eight, nine, and one operate largely from the instinct. So they operate largely from a very guttural response. It's immediate, it's quick, it's kind of, it's like that, okay? The two, threes, and fours, well connected to the heart. So the two, threes, and fours are very connected to love and appreciation to different degrees. And we'll talk about that when we look at each of the types. And the five, sixes, and sevens, the thinking types, are interested in logic, the head, can we rationalize it? Can we work with this stuff that we're thinking about? Um, and actually, let's not even bother thinking about the gut instinct too much and the heart too much, okay? So the challenge in each instinct group is to appreciate the instinct of the other types because in there is where the juice and the magic sits. Okay? So our invitation is to work from our type, understand our type, but also understand the aspects of the instincts that we may find more difficult. Okay. In terms of the underlying message for the purposes of this talk, 
This is the underlying message from each of the instinct groups. So the 8, 9, and 1 are really saying in very different, very different ways, don't mess with me. Okay? Don't mess with me. If I'm an 8, don't mess with me because I will challenge you. If I'm a type 9, don't mess with me because I'm just a peacemaker trying to make everything okay around here. I'm trying to balance everything. I'm trying to make everything okay. I'm trying to make everybody feel as though the world is a nice place, sitting on my mountain, making everything all right. But don't mess, don't mess with me too much. If we're the 1, we're very keen on right and wrong. We're very keen on yes and no. And we're very keen to basically say, don't mess with my world too much because I know what the right answer is. Okay? And don't shake my world too much because if you shake me out of this right answer, I don't know how to orientate myself. The two, three, and four is saying, see me. So in terms of trust, they're the people asking that question, can you see me? Not just what I do, but can you see me? Effectively, what they're saying is, can my heart connect to your heart? Do you see me, not just my work, not just what my head can do? Do you see the inner me? And they want to be seen in the way that they want to be seen. So if you think of the two, three, and four types, what they're really doing, if you think about your arm, the two you would describe as the heart on the sleeve person. So somebody orientated from type two, they're, they're the kind of unconditional love people. Very little shakes their world around their unconditional love. You'd have to do a lot to stop a two from loving you. Okay? It's possible, but you have to do quite a lot. The threes are more of the achiever types, and the three is still coming from the heart, but it's effectively seeing some of this is actually about me. Some of this, I, I love the world. I love what I do. I love doing. I'm a workaholic, and I love all that stuff. But actually, some of it's about me. The four um, is I am unique. I love the world. I'm a creative type but there's only one of me, okay? So that's the dis distinction in those see me. So don't assume that all the two, threes, and fours want to be seen in the same way because they do, we do not. When we're orientating from this place, we do not want to be seen in the same way. The worst thing you can say to a type four artist like a David Hockney or somebody is, oh, I like your work, it's a bit like so-and-so's, okay? Because it's not, I'm unique. It's nothing to do with it. It's not, nothing like so-and-so's. Five, six, and seven are really coming from a place of anxiety. And what we're doing at five, six, and seven is actually asking, what can I trust? Not who can I trust. What can I trust in this world? So the five is trying to find out what can I trust by analyzing and finding information. The six is trying to find out what can I trust by testing out relationships and relationships, particularly around loyalty. And the seven is asking what can I trust by just going and finding something else when they can't find what they want. Okay, so it's kind of trust, it's not quite sure I'll go and find something else. Okay. So this is the orientation, this is where the orientation drives from in relation to things like trust. So let's take a look at the uh, um, gut instinct triad, which is the eight, the nine, and the one. So the triad at the top of the Enneagram. That you've got this in your book, so I'm not going to go over this in a, a lot of detail, but the eights can be, so imagine, so think of this as can be, you may not have all of these attributes. So don't be ticking them off like I haven't got that one, so therefore I'm definitely not on eight. Um, eights can be all these lovely things on the left-hand side. They can also be these sometimes challenging things on the right-hand side. A lot of chief executives come from the orientation of the type eight. A lot of chief executives um, in the banking industry, definitely from the orientation of the type eight. So I coach somebody who is in the banking industry, who is a director. I'm not going to tell you which bank it is, but it's an interesting bank. And... Um, bank of some reputation and of uh, great interest in the public at the moment. Anyway, uh, when I walk into this bank, um, they have this kind of, it's like it's about this big, and they have this open plan office, and they have uh, cubes, you know, it's like Cubeville, that cartoon. And at the end of the office, I'm going to make up a name, Alan. It's Alan's uh, glass, full-length office with his board table room at one side, his private office with the door shut and the curtain shut at this side, and his personal office where he sits and surveys the world in the corner. He's definitely a type eight. He shouts a lot. He shouts quite a lot at me. And um, when I walk in, the room goes like this. Thank God. Okay? Because they know that I'm coming to do some coaching with him. And that when he's had his coaching, it's a little bit more reasonable for a period of time. Now, it is a stressful job. It is a very stressful job. 
Um, he has a lot of weight on his shoulders in terms of finance and in terms of his bank. But actually, he can sit around here quite a lot. He sits in this space of being insensitive and bullying and vindictive quite a lot. Um, and I might go and see Alan, and um, he'll be not be ready, and he'll be saying, F, is he, are you here again? That, was, that might be his first reaction. And I'll say, hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Um, and inside, I'm thinking, you haven't had the same reaction. Um, but something in him trusts me to look after him. Okay? So I'll just sit myself down. He'll be, I don't think I've got time for this. I don't even know why I'm having this coaching. I can't believe it comes around once a month so quickly. Da, 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 and he's off on one. Okay? He's away. And I just sit there. And I let him rant and rant and rant. And I can see the people outside going like this. The more that he's speaking, they're almost going like this, putting their heads in their hands. And I let him rant and rant and rant. And I'll just let him rant for about 15 minutes. And I'll say, we've got about an hour left. Are you going to be ready any time soon? <laughs> or would you like to keep ranting? Is that being helpful to you? I'll go, oh, eventually, oh, we better get on with it and do something then. And I'll sit down and I'll just say, I'm sorry. Because he's got a deep heart. So the eight has a very deep heart. It's just hidden. So the eight needs a lot of patience. Okay? And they need patience to help them to be more of this side. Because actually, they are people who we need in organisations because they're very direct. They get things done. They're very strong. They hold a lot of things up. The basic fear, so I'm going to do each of the types in this way so you understand the orientation of the type. The basic fear of, a t of an eight is of being harmed or controlled by others. So the idea, so me entering his domain of Alan, he sees as me trying to control him. The next hour and a quarter, this woman's going to try and control me. I use the word try deliberately. Okay, I'm not. I'm trying to tell him to see himself. But he fears I'm trying to control him. The basic desire is to protect themselves and be in control. So control is the watchword. Control is very important in terms of trust. If I'm not in control, I can't trust myself. If I'm not in control, I can't trust what's going on out there. If I'm not in control, we might make a mistake. If I'm not in control, yeah. So you can see the scenario that he, as an eight, is coming from. The potential advantage for us at point eight is our ability to highlight issues of trust robustly and in good time. We don't mess about at type eight. We just say, this is a problem. We've got an issue around trust. We need to do something. Supply relationship's not working. We need to do something. Okay? The potential area of development for us at point eight is to be able to access that heart and show compassion and to be able to be a little bit vulnerable where trust becomes an issue and allow other people to do that too. So allow ourselves to remember that other people may sometimes feel vulnerable and may need to express their vulnerability. Martin Luther King, definitely an eight. I am not interested in power for power's sake, but I'm interested in power that is moral, right, and good. So in this trial, in this um, eight, type eight, we're coming from the place of wanting to do the right thing. It's not being difficult for the sake of being difficult. We think we're trying to do the right thing. Other people may see us and think we're not trying to do the right thing, but that's because we're in our type and we can't see it. Okay. The type nine, the peacemaker, the lovely peacemaker sitting on a mountain. Uh, nines are wonderful. Um, Jenny, who co-wrote the book with me, is a type nine. Um, it was a bit of a challenge writing a book between a type nine and a type seven, but we managed to do it. And in terms of the nine, they're very, very understanding, very patient, very connected to the world. So they're quite sensitive to the world. They can also be very stubborn, and they can avoid conflict. So if there's a problem, a nine can avoid the conflict until such time as there is no avoiding it anymore. So sometimes, in terms of trust, it can be difficult to trust a nine because we sometimes wonder whether they have our back. Do they actually have my back? Okay. If something goes wrong, are they prepared to have the argument around here? The basic fear of a nine is of loss and separation. They don't want to be disconnected from people. They like connection. The basic desire is to have peace of mind. Don't want too much conflict going on in this head, is the mantra of a nine. The potential advantage <coughs> for us at point nine is our ability to think clearly and see all sides of an issue. We're very, very good at that at point nine. Potential area for development is to handle the conflict or express it where trust has been broken. So to raise issues where we know there's a concern is the issue for us at point nine. Momolan, definitely a nine. Everyone has got to give a little. No one is going to get 100% of what they want. If everybody's willing to accept some change, we can do it. So there's a mediation 
in the nine. It's about compromise. If we all compromise a bit, we'll get somewhere. The ones, perfectionists and reformers. So very often, the kind of campaigning types, the ones, like reform, like to make sure that things get done, like right, wrong. Visionary principled can also be judgmental and can be a bit critical and controlling. So issues of trust can show up for the one in relation to them trying to control everything and not trusting other people to get things right. Can we delegate this to Tom? Will he dot the I's and cross the T's properly? Is the kind of thing that one might say. Basic fear of a one is of being corrupt or defective. The basic desire to be good, to have integrity and to be balanced. Potential advantage for us is our ability to hold teams to account against a set of values and principles. They're very principled in their approach, so they hold people to account. Potential area for development for us at point one is to start from a position of trusting first and testing later. So somebody mentioned that over here in one of the groups, um, that sometimes what we do is we say to people, um, I will test you first to decide whether you earn my trust. That would not happen at point one. We like to trust people until such time as we can't do it. So, Hillary Clinton, probably my worst quality is that I get very passionate about what I think is right. And they do. They think it's right. They think they're right. So we're going to look at the um, type points. Now, if we could have the chairs, that would be great. Um, and if we could have the three volunteers who have agreed to come and do um, some work on the stage from the position of types 8, 9, and 1, that would be marvellous. So would you mind just saying a little bit about what it's like to trust from your type? It's easy to trust in a structured environment. Okay. If the environment isn't quite structured enough, I get very worried. Okay. I'm a type eight. Um, I think where I work, I need to work within boundaries. Mm. And with those boundaries needs to come that trust. And that's from top down and bottom up. Mm. So for me, I work with some specialists. So they have the specialist knowledge that I don't have. Therefore, I have to trust them to do the job that I need them to do. I think what Helen said this morning resonated very well with me, is I trust somebody until there's a point where I can't. Yes. And then that proves difficult. But for my personality, I need to be able to trust the people to do the job. Okay, thank you. Um, for me, trust uh, takes quite some time to earn. I'm a, a peacemaker. I work in two arenas. Um, my day job, in charge of some uh, staff, and um, operations of firefighter in charge of uh, people on the fire ground and there people have to trust in me by mm. my rank they have no time to not trust me uh, and that, that's earned perhaps uh, that's my performance um, but generally trust is as the maxim this morning said about arrives on foot and leaves on horseback yes. it's on reputation thank you could you tell us a little bit about coming from your orientation from the gut instinct how how could we trust you more uh, for me personally, it's about um, my performance uh, and, and people can trust in me by I'll do things on time. Um, by the time I say I'll do them to a very high level. Um, and that's how I earn their trust and they can trust in me by my performance. Mm -hmm. So through your performance, we could trust you more. Thank you. I work in health. <laughs> um, at a, I've got to a fairly senior level within an organisation. And I think that should come the same with the gentleman here with a rank that shows that you've earned that level of trust. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen when you're in that sort of organisation unless a control element that there's a micromanagement on you and therefore you're not able to work within the boundaries that you should be able to work within with the rank that you've achieved within your job. Okay, thank you. And I think like my colleague on the end, I'd say perform to a high standard. Uh, but also be careful about being judgmental. Um, apparently there's a saying in the old sailing fraternity that when the master is, or when the first officer is birthing the ship for the first time, the master must bite his tongue until it bleeds. Oh, do you like that one? It's very appropriate. Okay, <laughs> right, thank you very much, thank you. Okay, get a feel, thank you. Okay, so that's a feel for the gut instinct. So just kind of hold that, okay? Part triad, the lovely loves. Give a helpers, very, very lucky to have a two in your life because they will always love you unconditionally. 
They may not like you all the time, <laughs> but they will always love you unconditionally. They're very generous, they're very open-hearted and very kind. On a bad day, they can be a bit martyrish and a bit indirect. So you'd know that a two's unhappy with you because they won't speak about it. They'll get upset about it. And then they'll keep saying things like, am I the only person around here who knows where the dishwasher is and the washing machine? Okay, it's that kind of thing. There's a kind of almost thing, okay? In terms of the twos, their basic fears of being unwanted, unworthy, or unloved. Their basic desire is to feel loved, to be seen. Potential advantage for us at point two, if we're coming from point two, is our ability to show real kindness and empathy with others, particularly people who are affected by issues of trust. Okay, so there's a compromise of trust. We're very good at helping people when we come from the point of two. Potential area of development for us at point two is to express our own needs clearly and directly. So not to kind of wander around in the mire of feeling that we are being done to rather than having any control. Desmond Tutu, how appropriate. Um, it's a two. My father always used to say, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. Good sense does not always lie with the loudest shoulders. Uh, sorry, shouters. Nor can we say that a large, unruly crowd is always the best arbiter of what is right. Love that. Producer achiever type threes. Type threes are what we would sometimes term the, al uh, the alcoholic, the workaholic type. <laughs> There might be alcoholic types amongst the type threes, but it's not a feature, okay? Um, the type three's basic phase of being worthless uh, and their desire to feel valuable and worthwhile. So we're working as type threes, achieving, 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 in order most of the time that people will recognize that we have a role to play around here. We're worthwhile, we've got something to contribute. Potential advantage for us at point three in terms of trust is our ability to get things done and keep things going in the face of adversity. So the resilience of the three is very, very high. Potential area for development for us at point three is to accept imperfection in others and ourselves. We're achiever types. We don't take passengers. Okay, so sometimes at point three, in terms of trusting, we have to be very careful about imperfection. Threes can be all of these things on the left. They can be these things on the right. They can be a bit manipulative sometimes. But the real wonderful thing about the three is their ability to be goal-oriented and to stay goal-oriented. They're outcome-focused, the threes. So you can trust a three to get it done. They'll get it done. Even if they're working till midnight, they'll get it done. Obama's a three. I always believe that ultimately if people are paying attention, then we get good government and good leadership. And when we get lazy as a democracy, shortcuts, uh, sorry, and civically start taking shortcuts, it results in bad government and bad politics. So threes do not like shortcuts. They don't like people making mistakes. They like to get it right. The fours, who can be creative, inspired, abundant, very sensitive, and highly intuitive. A four will read what's going on intuitively before they've even thought about it. They can also be a bit self-pitying and a bit dramatic, the fours. So lots of actors and actresses are fours. Basic fear is of having little or no significance, of being unimportant and unnoticed. Basic desire is to find their identity. So sometimes with people might ask my identity or... My job is my identity, it's highly creative, I'm, I'm an innovator. So uh, uh, to have that noticed, be seen with that is very important for the four. Um, the uh, ability of the four in terms of trust is to think of creative solutions very, very quickly and to handle issues sensitively. So you can trust a four to go off and think of solutions and handle people well. Potential areas for development for us at point four is to handle difficult issues with balance and without needing to be front and central all the time. So sometimes the drama of the four, we see a lot of this in PR, for example, and the advertising industry, means that they've kind of got to be seen the whole time. So if there was somebody here who was a, a very, very strong type four, who was in s servicing at the back there, they would be around here all the time because they'd have to be seen, okay? Because at some level, it's about me being front and center and you knowing that I'm behind this, really. Okay? So that's important in terms of trust. Julian Fellows, Downton Abbey, um, everyone needs to feel they're part of something worthwhile, that in the last analysis, their life has some meaning, and in a larger context. The question is, what am I part of and what have I done? So these are the legacy types we've been talking about today and yesterday. The, these are people who need a legacy. They need to leave a legacy. It's not an option. 
So we're going to take a look at the heart types, and we're going to look at how the heart types show up in leadership. Could I have my three volunteers, please? Thank you. Hello. Hello. Look at me while I'm looking at them. So we'd love to hear what you have to say about trust. We'd love to hear how you trust at work. How does trust show up for you at work? Okay. Um, well, for me, I'm a middle manager, so I think trust for me comes from two directions. One from the staff that I lead, and also from the senior leaders above me. I have to say, I, I'm, a, I'm a four, typically, and um, I store greater faith in the trust that I earn from those uh, who I line manage, and I'm really sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. uh, as a four, I hate processes. I, ha I have to say, they fill me with dread. That's a real development area. Um, and when a change, a process is coming in, um, I always try and think of it from the people that I like and manage and their perspectives and get their input, because I think that's really important. One, they'll understand it better than me, but uh, also, two, I try and explain the rationale and the background behind it uh, to gain their trust, because I think that's a really important point, which I think was made by Veronica earlier, yeah. earlier this morning. Um, so that's really how I try and, uh, and experience trust. Uh, it's not a quick win for me, though, because... Um, I don't fully subscribe that uh, ability is always um, central to uh, trust straight away. I think the personality comes first, and then you'll prove your, um, I approve my ability in a lot over a longer period of time. Thank Sorry, you. I'm waffling a bit now. That's all right. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm a two. Um, again, I'm in middle management. I'm, uh, I lead a, um, a team of 11. So I've also uh, report into line management, senior officers. Um, yes, I do wear my heart in the sleeve. Trust is important to me. Honesty, integrity. It's the way we work within the police service. Very important integrity. Um, it's also important in my value and beliefs. Um, if somebody has um, upset me or they have let me down, I do take that to heart, and I do perhaps take a little bit more personally, and it's getting that balance right of how you deal with those, because it's happening at, at the police service at the moment, mm. a lot of challenges with budget cuts, and um, yes, it's very important that we can trust our managers and be able to get through these challenges in a professional way. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, I'm a three, and I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I instinctively trust my colleagues and my staff. I, I give it very easily because I feel I'm trustworthy and I feel that's, you know, they should be the same. If anybody betrays that trust, and thank goodness that hasn't happened very often, it's very hard for me to then trust them again. I sort of find that odd. Yeah. Um, with senior managers, I expect them to trust me. Mm -hmm. And if they do, then I trust them. So there's a sort of um, two-way relationship there. So. Yeah. Can I just ask a very quick question? If you could give me one word that you would how you would describe trust, um, one adjective that you would say, if I was to trust people more, this is what they'd have to do. Uh, uh, pass for a minute. Let me okay, think about that right. one. <laughs> honesty. I, I was going to say honesty as well. I think that underpins everything. Honesty, authenticity, if you get that right, okay. you're on the way. Transparency, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you see the difference in the instinct groups. Okay. Head triad, five, six, seven. This is what fives can be. Very wise, very perceptive, very analytical. They can also be pedantic. A little bit distant and a little bit negative sometimes. Basic fear of a five is of being useless or incapable, so of being incompetent is the, the concern of a five. So remember, these are thinking types. This is what they're thinking. The basic desire is to be capable and competent, to be seen as somebody who knows what they're about and knows what they're doing. Potential advantage for us at point five is our ability to demonstrate wisdom from a position of truth. So we're very good at point five at saying, this is the truth and I know it to be true because it's based on analysis. So when we're giving those messages around change or messages that actually are unpalatable, the fives are really good at saying, this is why we need to do something. Here's the evidence. 
potential area for development at point five is to express our feelings in the moment before the desire for rational explanation has passed for other people. <coughs> so sometimes the five can go straight into analysis without actually saying, this is how I feel about it. Point six, oh sorry, point five, um, definitely, Mr. Microsoft. In this business, by the time you realise you're in trouble, it's too late to save yourself. Unless you're running scared all the time, you're gone. So for Bill Gates, there's an issue for him around, actually, if I'm not on top of my game and I'm analyzing, not analysing everything and understanding what the market wants, we're dead in the water. So that's the kind of fear of a five. Six, basic fear of being without support and guidance. Basic desire is to have security and support. The potential advantage for us at point six is to remain steadfast and loyal. These are the loyal types. A six would be a friend for life. You could tell a six anything and they wouldn't tell anybody. So the great people to trust at times of change are great people to trust with information that needs to be heard in the organisation. Potential area for development at point six is to notice where we get unduly suspicious of others and their motives. This is what a six can look like. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Woody Allen. I'm astounded by people who want to know the universe when it's hard enough to find your way around Chinatown. Okay? <laughs> That's the kind of thing of a six. It's an anxiety around, actually, why would you want to know that? Can we, why would you want to know that? Because we're still working on this. Why do we need to go there again? We're working on this. Okay. Seven. We heard quite a lot about the seven. Outgoing, option seekers, visionary, manically busy, find it difficult to complete, bit scattered. Basic fear is of being deprived and in pain, never deprive a six. Seven. Basic desire to be satisfied and content. So a seven becomes a great consume, become the great consumers of life. Okay. Nothing is enough. Potential advantage is at point seven in terms of trust, ability to remain focused on the big picture. We're very good at big picture. We're very good at long-term gains. Our area of development is to finish what we started. We leave loose threads all over the place at type seven. Branson's a seven. There's no greater thing you can do with your life and your work than follow your passion. So this is the legacy statement of a seven in a way that serves the world and serves you. Okay, big world servers, the sevens. So, head types, can I have my volunteers for the five, six, and seven, please? Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to trust from the place that you sit at? Um, I don't trust very easily. I don't trust authority <laughs> at all, unless it absolutely proves itself. I don't think that titles mean anything at all. And I like to know the data and the evidence but not only that, I need to know where that data has come from as mm -hmm. well. Of course. I like to know the absolute sources of everything. And I'm happiest if I know that there's a philosophical as well as scientific basis. Thank you. Um, for me, um, trust is similar to respect. It's there to be lost. So I instinctively, and I want to trust people from the start, but the moment they break that trust, they've broken something really precious in the relationship that we've established. Mm -hmm. What happens to your thinking when that happens, may I ask? My, what happens to my, oh, that's a good question. Now, my thinking then is, right, how do I get around the person I don't trust to carry on doing the things that I need to get done within my team? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm leading a new team, and I believe I need to gain their trust, so give them time to see how I work, get to know me. Um, I'm completely loyal to them and faithful and I will uh, absolutely advocate on their behalf but then I expect that loyalty in return as well. Um, in terms of um, people who I um, am accountable to, they need to set out rationally for me what the business case is and I need to believe in that business case and have their trust. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, could we just leave it at one question? Is that okay? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. So now we're going to take a look. Have we got any music? Can I go back? We're going to take a look at the results for Wales. So to give you a sense of the 300 people that we have, have gone through the RETI assessment within Wales, what does the distribution look like? So the 300 people aren't just the people in the room. We've also assessed some other people within Wales, within the Welsh Government and within the NHS. Um, and the pattern looks like this. So very few fours and fives, tiny number of fours and fives. 
And in terms of the instincts, the pattern looks like this. So 94 people coming from within the gut instinct. 86 people come from within the head instinct. 61 people come from within the heart instinct. The other people are in the undecided groups. They're the people who've got more than one type currently. And that's what it looks like. So if you to highlight a few things, let's just do five minutes on this at your table. Are we all right, do we say five o'clock? Yeah. Um, five minutes on your tables, and what I think I'm going to suggest is, can this side of the room, so these tables on this up to here, up to Bethan's table, can you do question one? What is really positive about this distribution? I'll put it back up in a minute. This middle segment, can you do... What concerns could this distribution raise in terms of Wales and leadership in Wales? And this side of the room, could you do what might it tell us about the basis of the trust relationship for how you trust and are trusted as leaders in Welsh Government? This is the question that Veronica was asking this morning. So let's take a look at it in terms of the distribution. Okay, have you got the question? Okay, okay, that's a quick look. So this side of the room, looking at so this side of the room, what about that side? What is really positive about this distribution? So this side of the room, can you tell us something about what is really positive about your distribution in Welsh public service? Mike's coming, the mic's coming. Somebody put the hand up who would like the mic? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, we were just saying that across the broad three types, it's, it's pretty balanced. Um, yeah. And actually, we wouldn't, wouldn't want too many individuals. You don't want 15 individuals on the rugby pitch. Um, so we, we thought it was a nicely balanced between the three core groups. Great. Thank you. So there's a, nice, there's a balance there. There's not a skew. If I do um, this in the banking industry... Where would you expect the skew to be? Sorry? More gut. Lot, a lot more gut. Yeah? It's a lot of gut instinct thinking. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Somebody else on this side? What else did you think was positive? I guess Hello? it leads on a little bit from that, which was um, a bit of a surprise. There was so much heart in that, but some recognition that um, we're in public service, so that might reflect the, the nature of the audience, as it were. It does to a degree. It's a really good point. So th in terms of the heart, you'll find a lot of heart-based people in leadership in things like nursing, in rescuer-type roles like the fire service. Okay? So think of the heart types, the, the kind of descriptions, givers, achievers. Okay? There's a kind of uh, essence about the heart types that you would find more readily in public service. Um, I think what we were saying is rather than looking for things that might be missing, that we saw a small four and a small five, it was about where else can we go to find that. Yes. And Lovely. again, looking at where we go for our sweet point. So we were starting to explore a little bit of that. So it was all about, yeah, it was evenly distributed. And it was quite nice to, to see some of the, you know, it's not a bad thing to see those bigger groups. And then we started to explore where we could find the other types. Lovely. So if we were looking at you as a whole and saying, actually, Wales needs to do lots of innovation, one could say, actually, it might be difficult to do that because you've got a relatively low number of fours, okay? And you've got a relatively low, no low number of fives who might do the analysis to inform that innovation. But it doesn't mean you can't do it. It means that we just have to think about our orientation and how do we become more of the four and the five for this particular piece of work? How do we mirror the behaviour of the five? How do we actively decide we need to be more uh, aligned with the type fours and fives, this particular type of ev event or particular piece of work? So some people in the middle, please, looking at um, what concerns could it raise? Anybody put your hand up? Yeah, great. Paul? Um, we, we said, or we, we were exploring the, the possibility, limited ideas and creativity, uh, okay. possibly... Um, the environment may dictate this kind of distribution. We were exploring some of that in the public sector, reflecting something to do with the underlying culture, maybe. Yes, yeah, say a bit more about that. Could you say, could you say a bit more about that? 
Um, well, we talked about the culture. Well, we, we, we explored the fact that culture hasn't really changed maybe in some parts of the public service for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, we're looking at a skills gap, particularly around the types four and five, which seem to be the ones that were, were the lower. Mm -hmm. So we were beginning to sort of unpack that a little bit, really. And the, and the issue is, thank you, the issue is it could be, we don't know, we don't know that, but it could be, could be something to go and look at. What else? Another table. Looking at the, thank you. Yeah, I think it's just following on from what he said, um, looking at the, the low number of the creative uh, people. Um, as, as children, we are just very creative. We think outside the box all the time. But it seems like as we get older, we're, we seem to be losing that. So it's where we can, again, find that within yeah. the organizations and lovely. investing some time into that. That's a lovely thing to, to highlight because my question to an organization, as an organization, with this kind of profile would be, how do you play? As an organization, how do you allow creativity to show up and how do you play? How do you allow fun in your organization? Okay. Anything else that people notice about the distribution in relation to particularly the gut types? The eight, nine, and one. We've got quite a lot of eight, quite a lot, relatively quite a lot of nine. There's a lot of people working from instinct in this group, in this 300 group. A lot of people working from instinct who might actually want to consider how much do I check my instinct with my thinking and my feeling. Okay, so thinking about the other types, the aspects of the types, how do I check that out? How do I check the instinct? Great. So let's go back to the other question, the last question for this side of the room. What might it tell us about the basis of the trust relationship for how you trust and are trusted? as leaders? This is Veronica's question this morning. Who would like to answer that question on this side of the room? We thought um, it wasn't a surprise. It wasn't a surprise, um, in fact, uh, that it was the gut. We also thought it might have something to do with age. All the senior people of a certain age might go with their gut. Um, but head was quite high too, so that was, m that was a bit more um, so that, uh, reassuring. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> reassuring. Uh, but we then realised that this was a snapshot of the default position. Yes. So we also well then sort of got more confident because it means that all we need to do is concentrate more on the uh, orientation of four and five. Yeah. And anyway, it's always good to have a balance. Any team we know should have a, a combination of all those different types of talent. Yeah, great, thank you. Another group. Behind you, Chris. Uh, I think it was quite interesting that we, we um, identified that the loyalists were the, uh, the largest group, number six, yes. um, have difficulty trusting people. And then we come back to the, the discussion or the uh, bits and pieces that we talked about this morning about uh, colleagues trusting senior managers. So it's obviously a correlation, this. So and don't forget, this is your group. Yeah. Okay? So this morning we were talking about how do we trust senior managers. You are senior managers in this group. You're middle managers and senior managers. So if you're showing up with a profile of this, this type, there'll be a level to which people out there are thinking what? What are they thinking in terms of trust? Sorry, can we get a mic? I think... They're thinking that we're not trustworthy and that we're um, results of a com command and control organisations. Potentially. Potentially. Can you see that? Yeah? Okay. What else can you see in this profile before we finish? What else might be? If people are looking at you as leaders, the people that you work with looking at you as leaders, through the lens of trust, what else might be a concern? With the high numbers in eight and nine in the gut, um, it could be perceived that the people at the top or senior and middle managers are high risk takers and mm -hmm. that can affect trust. I, either or, quite yeah. right. Either yeah. or, they're either high risk takers or they don't take risk because their gut instinct says no. Okay? So there's a potential here that people might think our leaders are not making decisions based on rational information, okay, based on logic and head thinking, nor based on how we feel and how we experience the world, okay? 
So there's a risk here, at not having lots of fours and fives, that you really have to work hard at appealing to the fours and fives who are out there. So really appealing to the heart and really appealing to thinking and ensuring that people understand where you're coming from. Okay? So, we're done. Thank you for your... I'm going to just skip through here because you've already answered those things. There are two reflective questions in the um, book which I'd like you to think about overnight if you can and maybe talk about them in your groups. But we're done. Thank you for your patience. It's